Rome triumphs and the empire expands, cities evolve and grow. Romanization prevails. Conquered cities are transformed and expanded, while hundreds of new cities are built. For many of these cities, the combination of knowledge and engineering know-how applied to the service of the people and the desire to copy the eternal city brought about a degree of progress and public well-being to a level never before achieved by any civilization. In the first part of Roman engineering, cities, we discussed the crucial factors that determined where and how the Romans founded their cities. We described the ideal model of a Roman city and how some cities adapted to this model and how others moved away from it. We also described some of their main constructions and buildings. In this new episode, we are going to deal with important aspects of Roman engineering that were applied to the cities and that have lasted for us to see. This will be done by interpreting the remains of some of these cities that have managed to survive to this day. We will begin our journey at one of the most remote, modest and unknown places in the empire, Los Bañales, a place located very close to the town of Sadaba, in the north of the Iberian Peninsula. Considering that the climate in this area is not benign, and there are no significant mining or agricultural resources, Surely its existence and development was due to the fact that it was a transit point on the Roman road that connected Caesar Augusta with the French region of Bien. Here, about 100 kilometers northwest of the great Roman city of Caesar Augusta, there was a small and isolated Roman city whose name is not known. We know almost nothing about it. On a nearby hill, there are remains of a pre-Roman indigenous village, but in this case the Romans ignored it when they occupied the area and established themselves next to it. Under these fields, you can find remains of the city completely buried and waiting to be excavated and studied. But excavations have now begun, bringing this small city into the light of day. However, something important in this city mysteriously survived without being buried, but remaining in a relatively good state of conservation. It is a notable building known by the knowledgeable of past centuries as a bathing place, and who gave it the name of Los Bañales. The Romans valued highly their hygiene and their comfort, and all cities, even the smallest, had public baths that were equipped with hot water. The user of the baths entered the establishment through this hall. Here you would find the ticket office or place to pay the bathroom fee. Then one would access the locker room or a poditorium. Where personal belongings were left. From here, one would access a mildly warm room called a tepidarium.
Here in the tepidarium they could do some exercises or avail themselves of a massage or various ointments. This room was heated and for this the floor was raised on small pillars that let warm air pass through. This technique was called hippocaustum. They also had walls covered with ceramic pieces called tegula mamata, which formed a chamber through which warm air passed. To the right of this room there was the caldarium, This room was also heated and had a small pool of hot water. Next to this room there was a room that served as a sauna called Sudatio. Its location was not chosen by accident. It would need to be very close to the heat source. Therefore, a boiler should be found close to it. The boiler was constructed of three cylindrical bodies through which water circulated. The cold water entered through the upper part into the upper tank. From there it passed to the next one, which kept the water warm. Down below, there was one that was in contact with fire that was handled by workers. This hot water was intended for the caldarium, and this same fire heated the hippocaustum and the vertical chambers of the walls. The heat would make its way through the spaces under the floor and walls, providing warmth to the rooms. On the opposite side to the left of the tepidarium were the cold baths or frigidarium. This room was not heated and there was a larger pool. There was yet another room for public use outside, which could be accessed independently, the latrines. The latrines are the Roman toilets. We are surprised by the archaic design and lack of privacy compared to our modern toilets. However, they represented one of the most remarkable health advances of the classical world. Human excrement is a source of diseases and epidemics, a fact well understood by the Romans. So it was essential to dispel the sewage from the city quickly and efficiently. Below these latrines, a substantial flow of water circulated that flushed away the sewage. The Roman baths were one of the fundamental services for the leisure activities of the town. It was an essential item for every city, and its size was dependent on the size of the city. If the baths at Los Bañales belonged to a small and modest city, what would the thermal baths of the largest and most important cities be like? To find out, we will travel to Italica, in the south of the Iberian Peninsula. Year 2006 BC. Publius Cornelius Scipio continues to harass the Carthaginian army in Hispania. For this, he sets out to conquer their last redoubts in the Betis Valley. The final battle will take place the Battle of Elipa. The Carthaginian commander Hasdrubal leads an army superior in number to the Roman army.
However, the strategy of Publius Cornelius Scipio is decisive. The Roman army has a resounding victory. The Carthaginians withdraw from Spain and Scipio returns to Rome as a hero. Before leaving, Scipio orders the construction of a city for his wounded soldiers and war veterans. A city that will be called Italica. Italica is located in the municipality of Santiponce, near the beautiful and important Spanish city of Seville. Its remains were here abandoned since the Muslim era until very recently. In all this time they have been visited, admired and above all looted. In the 18th century, even demolitions and blasting were carried out to extract materials and take advantage of them for roads and other constructions. Fortunately, today it is well protected and appreciated. Italica was established in an empty area and was the foundation for a new design, a hypodamic design, meaning it would follow the ideal model of the Roman city. Its area extended to about 52 hectares. Its amphitheater, located outside the walls, was one of the largest in the empire. With three levels of grandstand, it had a capacity for about 25,000 spectators. The theatre of more modest size allowed for some 3,000 spectators. Italica had at least two public thermal facilities. These remains that we see here correspond to one of them. They are called the larger thermal baths. To get to the baths, one would use the Decumanus, one of the main streets of the city. The building was entered by stairs that gave access to the main hall. The lobby looked out onto a T-shaped pool. As well as the other rooms. Including the Caldarium, Tepidarium and Frigidarium. The building also had rooms for servants, massage rooms, sauna, changing rooms and even a library. Adjoined to this area of the baths was a palaestra, a normal facility found in thermal baths of a certain size. Rectangular in plan, it consisted of a patio with a covered portico. The palestra was a space where the Roman citizen could practice fighting or perform different physical exercises, including equestrian activities. The rooms adjacent to the portico provided the facilities required for such activities. Changing rooms, stores or massage rooms. Italica's palestra occupied another two complete blocks, adding another 16,000 square meters. 
The total area of the larger thermal baths in Italica was four blocks, around 32,000 square meters. The public baths found in even the smallest cities are a good example of the importance that the Romans gave to hygiene. Not to hygiene alone, however, but also to comfort, one of the qualities most appreciated in ancient Rome. This Roman pursuit of well-being manifests itself forcefully in the design of residential areas in cities and in the homes of its citizens. Let's now travel to the archaeological site of Emporias, in the northeast of the Iberian Peninsula. Year 218 BC. In its strategy of war against Carthage, Rome decides to land in Hispania. The chosen place is Emporion an allied Greek city located on the northeast coast of the Iberian Peninsula. The Greeks of Emporion were threatened by the Carthaginians and had asked for help from Rome. The Romans decided to build a permanent army camp next to Emporion, which for a long time will coexist with the Greek city. Over the years, that camp became a new city. A city that was called Emporiae. Today, the legacy of Emporion is the rich archaeological site of Emporias in the northeast of Catalonia. Coming to Emporias is exciting, as we can visit the two cities, the Greek and the Roman. It was built to a new plan, in an empty area next to the Greek city that already existed. An ideal plan could be drawn for a Roman city. That is to say, a hypodamic plan. This is the Emporias Forum. It occupies about 10,000 square meters. In it, the site's administrators partially rebuilt the existing construction, allowing visitors to have an impression of the size and elegance that this place must have been. Despite being a small city, this square is overwhelming. A good example of the importance that the Romans gave to the public areas of their cities. Here near the Forum were the public thermal baths. They occupied about 2,450 square meters. They are much larger than the thermal baths of Los Bañales, but rather smaller than the larger thermal baths of Italica. In the northeast of the site, in the most well-positioned place, is where you find these remains. They correspond to one of the most important houses in the city, a Roman domus. It was accessed from the street, through this hallway. The domus was constructed around a central patio like this called the atrium. Around the atrium there were several rooms. Many of these rooms were paved with beautiful and handcrafted mosaics. The mosaics were made with small pieces of colored stone called tesselas. By combining them, one could obtain beautiful drawings and designs. In this domus, you would find magnificent examples of mosaics. Thank 
Here the walls tell us that they were plastered with lime and painted. The paintings decorated the walls, representing natural motifs, hunting scenes and other representative elements of Roman life, customs and beliefs. The rooms that surrounded the atrium were dedicated to the reception of guests with dining rooms and bedrooms. This house had areas and adjoining rooms such as kitchens, cleaning places, workshops and warehouses, where the servants got on with their work. It also had an area surrounded by a portico of columns called a peristyle. This was a private garden with ponds and fountains. Most probably the owners of this domus kept this place free from trees so they could contemplate the sea views. Some marvelous views. Large and luxurious, domus were common in Roman cities of certain size, but most of the domus that made up these cities were smaller and more modest. Towards the center of the site, we can make out a street that has been excavated and that can help us imagine it as a typical and modest Roman street. Let us interpret the remains. On each side, we can clearly see the base of some walls. They correspond to buildings that were erected along the entire street. Noteworthy are the numerous channels of various sizes that come from the buildings. If we observe carefully, we can see that they go down towards that central channel. These channels drained wastewater from the side buildings to be collected in the central channel, the sewer, which was the main sewer of the street. This part of the system is a sink designed to collect the rainwater that fell from the roofs and from the street itself. These sinks were distributed regularly along the street and they also drained into the sewer. All channels were covered. The central one with large stone slabs. Above them was the pavement of the street and on both sides a raised curb. The buildings of this type of street used to have shops on the ground floor and houses on the upper floors. The central sewer of the street, after collecting the water from the rest of the minor canals, joined others to form a complete sewage network that extracted the wastewater from the city, draining it in this case into the sea. Ampurias was a small city, but it already had a good sewage system. This was usual even in the smallest cities. The terrible epidemics of the plague that occurred in the West in many centuries of the Middle Ages would have been avoided in Roman civilization. In order to understand how sewage systems worked in larger and more complex cities, we will travel to Caesar Augusta, the current Spanish city of Zaragoza. Year 27 BC. Rome is about to conclude the total conquest of the Iberian Peninsula. Only a small territory of the peninsula northwest remains. But the northwest peninsula is mountainous and hostile. 
In it, the Roman legions cannot impose their open field combat strategy. The soldiers are forced to enter thick forests. There, the Cantabrians and Astorians practice a strategy of guerrilla warfare. The Roman soldiers suffer terrible ambushes and continuous defeats. The continuous failures drive Emperor Augustus impatient who decides to deploy by land and by sea a huge military force. The peoples of the north are definitely weakened. Caesar Augustus reorganized the provinces of Hispania and ordered a new and important city to be built for his war veterans. A city that will receive his own name, Caesar Augusta. Caesar Augusta was not the provincial capital, but it was a very important city. Like Taraco, the strategic location chosen for Caesar Augusta was very advantageous, and after the end of the empire, the city endured over the centuries. Today, that city is the current Spanish city of Zaragoza. Here in the center of Zaragoza, we find this modern and spacious plaza. In it is the famous basilica of Our Lady of Pilar. In the same way that this large square is in the heart of the city and is one of the busiest popular centers of Zaragoza, the equivalent of this place in Caesar Augusta was the Roman Forum. So if the current Zaragoza is on the old city, we are currently in the Roman Forum of the ancient Caesar Augusta. The remains of the Forum of Caesar Augusta were identified in excavations that took place in 1988. We are under the streets and buildings of the current Zaragoza, but also below the ground level of the Forum. Just up here was the Curia, where high-ranking citizens who directed and administered the city met. As we are below the floor level of the Forum, we have a great opportunity to understand the infrastructure that was under it. These large concrete blocks are the foundations of the columns of the porticos of the Forum. We also found some of the lead pipes belonging to the water distribution system to the fountains and for some commercial premises. Y 
And this is an extraordinary location from which to observe how the city's sewage system worked. We can see an upper sewer of one size that must have belonged to the sewage network of the Forum. But here another much larger, which would surely belong to the sewage network of the city. The one above, of a smaller size, takes advantage of the intersection to drain into this one below, that is much larger. And this is how the city sewer system worked. All the water was driven by gravity from one waste pipe to another, taking the combined flows into larger sewers. The remains that we have seen are here below. They are protected in order to be studied and are not accessible to the public. These are the remains from the southeast side of the Caesar Augusta Forum. The remains on the west side have benefited through the construction of an underground museum, an attractive modern museum, a must-see. This large collector, restored and open to visitors in the Forum Museum of Caesar Augusta, collected the waters of the whole area of the Forum and the nearby thermal baths. It is almost three meters high and more than two meters wide, which gives us an idea of the enormous flow of water that it once had to carry. It was of Roman concrete, and some walls still retain perfectly the imprint of the frames that we use to build it. Our image of Caesar Augusta is now more complete. And we can now better appreciate the unseen building and engineering efforts that lie behind the construction of Roman cities. As we have seen, a complex network of pipes were responsible for distributing spring water throughout the city. These distribution networks have scarcely survived. The metal parts were plundered after the disappearance of the empire. The ceramic parts were lost due to their fragility and parts made of wood naturally decayed and were lost. Although very dispersed, fortunately enough pieces and remains have survived to give us a very approximate idea of how the distribution networks should have been. In the Conimbriga Museum in Portugal, there is an interesting variety of pipes, joints and elbows, both of ceramics and lead. Ceramic pipes were very common. Preserved in the Museum of Arles, there is a ceramic amphora that clearly was used to make a 90-degree elbow and to counteract water pressure and prevent it from unplugging the elbows. At the British Museum in London, we have a spectacular example of clay pipes joined with lead. It is known that many cities had wooden pipelines of various forms, although only some exceptionally were able to be preserved such as the examples that exist in the Bordeaux Museum. The collection of Romul Gavaron and others distributed in many museums has impressive examples of valves intended to regulate or cut the flow. There is also a wide variety of pipes for fountains, swimming pools and public baths. In addition, there are taps for use mainly in the houses. The beauty and refinement of these specimens 
amaze those who are not knowledgeable as well as those who are. Now we can understand even better the well-being and luxury of Roman houses, imagining how these elegant pipes adorned the pools and fountains, or how the taps allowed them to have water at will, as happens today in modern houses. An extraordinary example of this is the boiler that is exhibited in the Museum of Arles, a demonstration of the fact that certain Roman houses even had access to hot water. But water distribution and sewage systems were not the only engineering infrastructures that are hidden under a Roman city. To be able to condition the terrain in order to build on it could require a lot of ingenuity and effort. We will travel to the current capital of Portugal, Lisbon, the old Olisipo, to make a surprising visit. Lisbon is a beautiful and modern city located in a very privileged location. A location where the mouth of the river Tejo forms a spectacular bay that offers a magnificent natural harbour. The Celtic people founded here a city that later attracted the Phoenicians, the great merchants of antiquity. The city allied itself with Rome when the empire began to conquer the west of the Iberian Peninsula. Therefore, Roman citizenship was conferred to its inhabitants and Olisipo obtained considerable autonomy as a Roman municipality. After the Romans, Lisbon had a very busy history. Arabs and Vikings, Muslims and Christians conquered, pillaged, built and rebuilt the city, erasing the remains of the Roman Olisipo and leaving few traces of what must have been that large city. Lisbon has a very sad day in its history. On November the 1st, 1755, All Saints' Day in the morning at Mass, a terrible earthquake shook the entire city, and practically all the buildings in Lisbon collapsed. This Gothic church was the largest in the city, and is one of the main memories of that terrible day, since it was not rebuilt. Today, these ruins remain here for your visit to the Archaeological Museum of Carmo as testimony of that terrible day. Lisbon was almost completely destroyed and no buildings were left standing. During the reconstruction work of the city, an unknown and mysterious structure was found that had managed to survive the catastrophe. That structure still exists and is here below the current streets and buildings of the current Lisbon. When people came down here, they found galleries formed by vaulted structures. Surprisingly, these galleries had withstood the earthquake. They did not know when or why they had been built, but they realized that, unknown to anyone, they had been sustaining a large part of the city's buildings. Now we know that these galleries are 2,000 years old. They were designed by Roman engineers when they built Olisipo. We are very close to the Tagos River, and here the water table, the water level constantly changes. 
In fact, these galleries are normally flooded. To avoid flooding, the Romans decided that the base of the Forum would be above the variations of the water table of the Tagus River. To achieve this, it was necessary to build a structure that would allow raising the level of the Forum. The solution they adopted was the design and construction of a large vaulted enclosure. But this work was not easy to design or execute. Due to the saturation of the soil, the terrain is very soft and inconsistent in this place. The Roman engineers knew that the foundations of the constructions subjected to a huge weight would sink. To solve it, they waited until the water table was at a minimum. They made a large excavation and built a huge concrete slab. On the slab, they were able to raise the great vaulted structure. And on it, the buildings. In this way, the whole system floats on the soft grounds, like a ship on the water. These vaulted structures, used on soft and inadequate grounds, are called cryptoporticos. Hidden and unknown, the cryptoporticos of Lisbon, or rather, the cryptoporticos of Olisipo, deserve our complete admiration. To our amazement and fascination, they not only withstood the terrible earthquake of 1755, but also the great earthquake of 1531. two of the most violent earthquakes known to man. After 2,000 years of history, today these structures still fulfill their mission perfectly, supporting part of the current Lisbon. The cryptoporticos were often used by the Romans to adapt the land on which they wanted to build. The fact that they were underground or semi-subterranean constructions and that the material used was concrete greatly facilitated their survival over time. But in addition, the efficiency and usefulness that they continued to offer, since it meant that there were very solid foundations on which to build. Therefore, it is not difficult to find medieval and modern cities supported by Roman cryptoportico arches. We find an excellent example in Coimbra, just 200 kilometers from Lisbon. Coimbra is a university city located on the banks of the Mondego River. Currently, its monuments and its relevant historical legacy are an important tourist attraction. The centre of the city has been built on that hill, the same hill that was chosen to locate the Roman city of Aiminium. Therefore, the forum of the city was located up there. In order to deal with the slope of the hill and to build a wide and flat forum, the Roman technicians planned a large cryptoportico to hold the enormous construction. Aiminium disappeared and other cities were built in its place, and all of them retained and took advantage of the cryptoportico to sustain their constructions. Nowadays, Coimbra uses the cryptoportico to support a large part of the National Museum Machado de Castro. The 
These cryptoporticals are the best preserved in the empire. Thanks to the fact that they have been integrated into the museum, today they have become a great tourist attraction. These spaces were available to be used and probably were employed in some way. But as humidity was high and the light was meager, they would not be used for anything important. These cryptoporticos are based on vaults built in Roman concrete. The strength and load-bearing capacity of these structures is enormous, as they had to support the full weight of the Imenium Forum, and today support a considerable part of the museum. The cryptoporticos were of an established design and were used by the Roman engineers continually in order to level the terrain and construct buildings on top of them. However, this was not the only solution. To our surprise, excavations in Caesar Augusta have uncovered a layer of amphoras in the subsoil, neatly placed and with open end facing down. They stuck into the soft ground and then were covered with successive layers of gravel, offering a stable platform. A part of the city was built on it. And in Arles, in the southeast of France, a great number of stakes made from the trunks of oak and pine were discovered driven into the ground. Investigations have shown that thousands of them were employed to support the Isle Circus. After digging out much of the material around the stakes, the space was filled with opus cementicium, Roman concrete. In this way, concrete and piles were united in the same foundation structure. The construction measured 450 meters long and 101 wide, and could accommodate around 20,000 spectators. The foundation prevented the building from sinking into the ground. To present our explanations of the engineering techniques that were used for building Roman cities, we have focused especially on cities in the Iberian Peninsula. This was done by looking for isolated and unknown places that are nonetheless worthy of being shown to the world. Although there are hundreds of great cities that have preserved their ruins, we had to leave them out of our episodes dedicated to the Roman cities. Some of them in the Iberian Peninsula itself, but many others far away from it. In the old province of Narbonensis, there are spectacular remains of important cities. Narbo, Arelate, Namausus and Aurausio received the name of Little Rome for their greatness and splendor. In France, there are ruins of many other cities such as Agosto Dunum, now Autun, and Doro Cortorum, today known as Rheims. In Britain, the present Great Britain, there are excellent remains of great cities such as Londinium, which gave its name to London, Aquaesulis, today the modern city of Bath, or Ratai, today called Leicester. Many more spread throughout Central Europe, such as Augusta Trevororum, the current German city of Trier, or military forts like the one we know today as Salzburg, which in addition to being guard posts on the Germanic frontier, also served as cities. Further south in present-day Croatia and the ancient Illyria region, we find remains of other important cities such as Pula and Salonai. In Albania, besides other ruins, you will find those of Apollonia. In the eastern and Hellenistic part of the empire, we have the magnificent spectacle of these cities, most of them surprisingly well-preserved. 
In Athens, there are the ruins of the Temple of Olympian Zeus, which was at the time the greatest in all of Greece. In modern Turkey, Ephesus with its majestic library, Sagalassos with a monumental nymphaeum, Aspendos with one of the best preserved theaters of the empire. The show continues through the south, in Lebanon, the great Heliopolis, present-day Baalbek, with its Cyclopean, colossal, and inconceivable constructions. And nearby, the great Gadara, Peia, Gerasa, or the mythical Petra, all in modern-day Jordan. To the west, you will find Sirene, Leptis Magna, or the wonderful Sabrata in Libya the ancient Tisdrus with its awe-inspiring amphitheater, or the great Carthage, both in Tunisia. The magnificent Tamugadi in Algeria, and in Morocco, the amazing Volubilis. And of course, the numerous cities of modern Italy, such as Caralis in Sardinia, the famous Syracuse in Sicily, the beautiful Verona, or the extraordinary Pompeii. And we would still leave out several hundreds of cities not named, all dreaming and trying to compete with Rome, the eternal city, where the spectacle and grandeur, even today, overwhelm the imagination. The statistics and dimensions of Rome are awesome. We would need many hours of documentary to learn in detail the Eternal City. Its structures and most spectacular buildings will be explored in further episodes. We are at the end of the episode. In it, we have made known the passion of the Romans for hygiene and comfort. We have seen the Roman baths and the engineering that is enclosed and hidden within them. And how even the smallest cities had such services. We have also seen how the Roman houses were. Both the most luxurious and impressive but also the more humble and modest. And how many of them had drinking water and waste and sewage systems. We have understood that large quantities of spring water reached the Roman cities. Water that was distributed throughout the city via a sophisticated distribution network and that once used was evacuated from the city through a complex and efficient sewer network, expelling waste water and sewage from the city. We have understood the imposing engineering techniques, the evidence for which is hidden under Roman cities, and at the same time the ingenuity and efforts that were necessary to adapt the terrain on which they were built. The Roman cities needed large quantities of water of excellent quality. Water that was captured in the rich springs of mountains and transferred to the cities thanks to ingenious aqueducts. Complex and admirable works that will be explored in the next episode. See you in Roman engineering, aqueducts.